Hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to introduce you to one of the students who's going to in- interview uh, and just attended the interview and waiting for the results. So this is a golden opportunity for the students who are going to give their first attempt and uh, planning to crack it in the first attempt. We have Vijay Vijay Babu. He is from Guntur uh, district, uh, Tenali, Andhra Pradesh. He graduated in 2019 and uh, it's his first attempt and he is going to the interview and he went to the interview and uh, he's waiting for the results. So hope all of you students uh, take full advantage of this great opportunity and clear all your doubts and take the guidance. Hi, hi Vijay. How are you? Hello, sir. Thank you for the introduction and good evening to everyone. I hope you are able to hear me clearly. Yes, sir. Everything is perfect, Vijay. Uh, and uh, I will uh, hand over the hosting for you. Uh, you can continue and share the screen. And uh, at the end, if anyone have doubts, you can on your screens and ask uh, uh, Vijay, sir, your doubts. Okay, okay Vijay, I'm uh, handing over it to you. I'm putting it on Spotlight so everyone can see. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. So like Sir had uh, introduced, uh, this was my first attempt. And my optional subject is sociology. And I've given my interview uh, in the last week of August and I'm waiting my, res- waiting my results now. So uh, uh, I think what we have, I plan to share with you, uh, all of you guys is my own experiences with prelims and how I'd revised static portion of prelims uh, in the last one month, the current affairs portion of prelims in the last one month and uh, in general about my interview experience, etc. So uh, before I go ahead with that uh, short disclaimer, so uh, these are simply my own personal experiences. So these might not necessarily work for all of you. And secondly, I must acknowledge that I was uh, lucky enough to be able to devote my full time for uh, UPSC preparation. I understand that some of you might have constraints of working while also preparing. So tweak these, uh, uh, my experiences according to your own convenience and adapt them. So uh, now I'll uh, share my screen with you people and and also uh, please feel very free to interrupt me at any point uh, while I'm speaking or you can drop a question in the chat box or you can just open your mic and uh, ask me any question uh, while I'm talking. Um, I hope you guys are able to uh, see my uh, screen. So firstly, I thought I'd share how I prepared for the static portion in the last one month. Uh, Starting with polity, history and geography are the three subjects that I thought I'll talk to you guys about. Uh, So firstly, uh, with polity, so I think one of my, one of the very important aspects that helped me in clearing prelims is to have very concise and compact notes uh, from which I could uh, revise nicely in the end. And most of the notes that I'm going to share with you guys right now is made in the last one month of 40 days uh, uh, before prelims. So I'm sure you guys can also do the same and uh, this will be of huge, huge uh, help in clearing prelims. So uh, firstly with polity, you can see all of you know from Lakshmi Khan, there are parliamentary committees in Lakshmi Khan. So, uh, uh, I put all of this in a tabular format so that it becomes really easy for us to revise and also to compare between different committees. I mean, to me personally, if, if it's put out in this form, it becomes a lot more easier for uh, me to grasp the information and also to retain it. So you can see uh, I put all the parliamentary committees like this and, you know, color coded them, like three of them, which belong to one header and in one color. And then, you know, you, you can see this uh, happening. So similarly, uh, I've also done the same with uh, constitutional bodies. So uh, see, I've put all the constitutional bodies in a tabular format and uh, this all boils down to three pages. So this does two things to us. One, it reduces the time that you need to invest when it comes to revision. Now, if you can recall constitutional bodies, I think uh, are around 10 chapters in uh, Lakshmi Kant. Now, all of the 10 chapters is condensed into just two pages here. 
you see and also it becomes very easy for you to compare so that you don't get confused for instance whether a person is appointed by the president or appointed by the president under his warrant and seal or if his conditions of service are given in the constitution or determined by the presidency it's written in the uh, uh, tabular format so this is this is a very uh, useful way of doing it is what i felt uh, while devising polity same i've done similar stuff with non constitutional bodies the panchayati raj system so in the end it just uh, took me around 12 to 13 hours to revise the entire uh, lakshmi kant book just uh, two to three days before prelims so this is a useful thing that uh, i suppose you people can also do so uh, moving on to uh, modern history i just thought i'll share snippets of different subjects two to three snippets of different subjects and you, you guys can ask me any doubts um, while i'm going through it now next is uh, modern history again in modern history one of the very uh, important areas is this organizations uh, and who is found founded them and also where they have worked in the sense what is the main theme that was running behind this areas of uh, their areas of work now you might ask these are already almost given in a concise form in uh, spectrum so why uh, make a notes yeah jyoti me i think you have a question please go ahead sir good evening sir yeah, hey, just just call me vijay <laughs> yeah, yeah go ahead sir, sir actually this table for me is awesome sir so is it useful for the mains perspective also only for just prelims only the, the tables yes sir it's definitely very useful for mains also because in mains also uh, in either the bodies or say in the conclusion or any way for instance uh, there could be a question on the role of cag and then you can always mention say uh, uh, either probably say a particular article or um, where is cag see um, just give me a second um, okay yeah. so cag is here if you can see on the screen now if you have this table in front of you you will be able to quickly recall say uh, while writing ca answer on cag you can start by saying article 148 of the constitution says or you can say they have a security of tenure or you can say that uh, you know the, the uh, uh, cag does not have the power to uh, uh, you know go through the accounts of the government before they are uh, already present so it becomes very easy for you to quote them in the introductions as well as the conclusions so yes i would say this is very useful for mains as well as for interview also like before interview also i refer to these uh, uh, tables uh, is that clear jyoti ma'am or do you have more? yes sir and that out sir please uh, yeah, yeah. apart from the scabular form content we have to incorporate the current affairs which will fetch at least tw- uh, i mean 200 to 250 words for, uh, according to the demand of the question Uh, yes uh, yes yeah, sure so um, uh, would it be okay jyoti ma if, if we sort of deal with the prelims part first and then we can deal with the mains part uh, um, segment it into prelims mains and interview is that okay if we do that yes sir yeah yeah i'll definitely come to your uh, question once i'm just done with this, uh, prelims part so uh, thank you so much on. yeah sure uh, so uh, moving on uh, so coming to uh, modern history uh, like i was saying these are most more or less given in spectrum but in very different places and also it become to me personally it became really difficult for me to retain so much of information i mean modern history is heavy on information and facts that you need to remember so uh, i started doing putting this in a tabular format and you guys can put it either uh, or, you know do it digitally or uh, you can do it uh, uh, with the pen and paper method anything works so two things again one is this builds what is called your muscle memory while writing it down it also gets uh, recorded in your brain and it becomes really easy for you to recall so if you can see i have written down all the uh, organizations and founders and there are different places through uh, spectrum so you can see there are 35 here and there are about 100 of them throughout the entire book and it's not like you need to sit and write all of them down in one go whenever you are revising a particular chapter just whatever is there in the chapter just put this paper right next to you while uh, revising a particular chapter and write just one organization down there uh, while you revise it so at the end of it as it nears prelims it becomes really easy for you to revise all of it and also again the comparison part you know for instance see here the first one here is bharat dharma mahamandal on the screen 29 and uh, 33 is bharat sri mandal so when it comes to names like this we might get very confused as to who is the founder and what is it that they're dealing with 
similarly there is a, a in another paper that i have not put here there are about five to six organizations that dealt with untouchability harijan sang untouchability league untouchability organization so for you to compare and get the correct uh, founder in your mind this again is a very useful exercise so uh, moving on similarly i put uh, all the words and everything in one page so that i can remember just what is the conclusion of the war and then what is the treaty that has happened after the end of the war and you can see my scribblings next to it it was just about who was the governor or the governor general when that particular war was happening and moving on i thought uh, i would share with you guys some of the tricks that i used to remember again might work might not work for you guys but uh, i thought i'll share with you people so this these are the list of governors and vice royals so to me personally i found it really hard to remember all of them in the chronological order so what i've done is uh, i've made uh, i i put the number of years that was gap that the gap was there or the the tenure for which they have served each governor general served for instance warren hastings served for 12 years cornwallis served for 7 years so i put this thing down and after a while it it becomes much easier for you to remember this for instance see here uh, if you start with uh, lord northbrook there are four times that four people have served four years tenure then after that then again here the trick that i put is lands down the name of the governor general is lands down so down from here you will have a recurring pattern of 656565 one governor general would serve for a tenure of 6 years then the next one would serve for a tenure of 5 years similarly 6565 and all then when it comes to the 12th one lord kensford and all of you know if you've done modern history lord, during lord kensford is when the 1919 reforms have happened so i put this trick here that the 6565 pattern will get reformed at kensford and become a 555 pattern after this if you can see reading south for 5 years lord even also south for 5 years willingdon also south for 5 years then the next two people the gap between both of them is also 5 years so uh, you can maybe work out some other mechanism but the purpose of showing you people this is there are different ways of retaining information if you cannot retain the information in its bare form like just remembering the years was very difficult for me all the years so i would just remember say lord northbrook started at 1872 and then i know the entire pattern in my head four four times and then six five three times so by then by that i can figure out any question for instance prelims they can ask you know who was the viceroy when uh, uh, some co non cooperation movement was happening or uh, civil disobedience movement was happening and all of us know the years it happened in 1930 1920 so using this pattern you can recall who was the wise story i hope this is clear to you people then uh, again important congress sessions this is also one of the important areas in modern history so i have again written all of them down and trust me all of this was done in the last 25 30 days so it doesn't take a lot of time and all of you people can also do it right now so uh, again heard there are some tricks and these are not my own these are some tricks that i picked from the internet but uh, just to show you guys one example the third one uh, it says begum gandhi of 24 demanded pool side snacks with nehru in lahore tonight but patel of 31 asked for fried rice a new eco pot from karachi gandhi went on second table so initially i was finding it really difficult to remember which uh, thing was done in which session so this is an interesting sort of a lame story but an interesting story that i found online which will help you uh, remember things if you see the first one is begum gandhi of bel begum gandhi of 24 now what the, what does this mean begum reminds you of belgaon belgaon is the only session in which gandhi presided only congress session in which gandhi presided and it happened in the year 1924 so this is what you take away from this and this helps you retain it better and then demanded pool side snacks with nehru in lahore tonight so what does pool side snacks remind you it reminds you of purna swaraj it starts with p and s and purna swaraj nehru presided over that session in lahore tonight reminds you of something to do with 2 and n 29 so 1929 session in lahore is when purna swaraj demand was adopted so then moving on 
Patel of 31 asked for fried rice and new eco pot. So this is a very vague sentence, but again, Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel presided over the 1931 session in which fried rice, F and R, fundamental rights, and uh, the National Economic Program, NEP, were adopted in the Karachi session. So this should remind you that 1931, Patel, uh, fundamental rights and uh, new national economic program is adopted. Then Gandhi went on second table. And this is a very easy thing. I'm sure all of you remember that second round, con second round table conference is the only one in which Mahatma Gandhi had participated. Then uh, the later part uh, where I'm talking about the precedents, uh, uh, this is again something that I've done much later after I've analyzed the question papers. That usually they ask questions like, uh, X person has never been the president of uh, Congress sessions, or uh, X person has presided over the Congress sessions the most number of times, etc. So I just went through the Wikipedia page of all the Congress presidents and I've made this tally. Now it becomes really easy for me to figure out who's presided over the most. Clearly, it's Jawaharlal Nehru at number five. And then there could be a question that Dada by Nauraji is the only one who has presided over Congress three times. And you know that it's wrong because see, there is someone else at number three, Madan Mohan Malviya, who has also presided over Congress sessions three times. So this putting them down in such simple uh, and easy ways to remember helps you recall things better. So similarly, the first one, if you see, Congress of 85, Bandra in Bombay. So Congress was initiated in 1885 in Bombay, in Bandra, invited 88 generals, all English. So 1888 is the first session when uh, uh, all English, it was presided over by uh, an English person. First English president of a Congress session was in 1888. George Jewell was his name. So G reminds you of that. And then to meet Annie of Calcutta in 1917. So 1917 is the first session in which a woman presided over a Congress session who was none other than Annie Besant. And Sarojini aged 25 in Kanpur. So Kanpur was the first session in 1925 in which an Indian woman presided over a Congress session. So again, these first and all concisely put in one um, vaguely formed sentence or a story. Uh, moving on again, see, uh, legislations is one of the biggest part of modern history and also where definitely at least a question comes from the legislations. And to me personally, legislations were one of the areas where I was getting really confused from one legislation to another. So what I've done is, and legislations are there in two books that we read. One is Spectrum and the second is Lakshmi Kant. And both of them cover there is a major overlap, but there are also some uh, legislations which Lakshmi can cover that um, spectrum omits and vice versa. So I put all of it at one place so that it becomes easy for me to recall. And also I can understand the chronology of it, what evolved into what. So if you can see, and these are not very elaborative that I put in all the features of a particular act in one place. No, only those features of the act that I think are important or that I think are some things that I can't remember. Like I need to put it down somewhere. So see, and I've also highlighted the most important parts of that particular act. See, the Regulating Act has British cabinet's control over Indian FS were firstly put in 1773 Regulating Act. Then there was an Amendment Act. Then there was Pitts India Act was the first time when the territories were called British possessions. And what is known as a dual government has come into place with this act. Similarly, see, uh, the Charter Act. So see, I've highlighted the important part here that Charter Act 1813 was the first time state responsibility of education was put in a policy and companies monopoly was ended. So this was a question in 2018 also companies when which act ended the monopoly of company in trade. So just put down the important uh, points here and then highlight them so that it's easier for you to recall. All of us uh, humans are uh, very uh, visual recallers in the sense, uh, when you put it in visual formats, uh, you know, highlight it or put it, see it in a picture or see it in a graph or a map, it becomes really easy for you to recall that entire picture while you are attempting in the exam. Thereby your chance of getting the answer correct is much, much higher. So I've just put two pages here, but of course I had all the acts written down in this format. I just put two pages here. Now, moving on, I thought I'll also share with you guys another important uh, pillar of my entire film's preparation is the use of maps. 
I have extensively used maps uh, for a, wherever I can, and that has helped me again in two ways: easier recall and also for uh, better retention. So I thought I'll start with uh, uh, ancient history first. Ashokan edicts. I'm sure all of you know uh, Ashokan edicts. Uh, there are uh, pillar edicts, rock edicts, etc. And trust me, guys, all these map uh, things that I'm going to show you throughout the course of uh, this uh, period, they do take some time while you're putting, uh, while you're making it for the first time. But these are the best. These are the best written on investment in that you will never have to make them again once you make them. And it becomes much easier for you to remember and also answer questions because a lot of times they, it just does not suffice if you just know what is a particular edict. You also need to know uh, in which area that particular edict is or in which area that particular thing exists. So putting it on a map makes it really easy for you. Now, uh, I hope you guys are able to see this clearly. I've used different colors for different edicts. See, I have put the list also here. So uh, everything in pink is, uh, are the major rock edicts. Everything in purple are the major pillar edicts. Everything in orange is minor pillar edicts and everything in black is minor rock edicts. So putting it here, I know. So if say there comes a question as to uh, say there are no pillar edicts in the state of uh, Bihar or there are no pillar edicts in the state of Jharkhand. If such a statement comes now, since I remember this map and I remember that maybe there are no rock edicts here or there are rock edicts here or some edicts here, it becomes really easy for me to eliminate that option or uh, correct that option. So I would recommend you guys also do things like this. And this is also a very good, a good way of remembering information also. So moving on again, Harappan sites. So if you can see, uh, this might look like I put, it takes a lot of time and trust me, it did not take more than 40 to 45 minutes. And I drew it, uh, uh, just putting a map underneath, I just traced the boundaries and then I started drawing the rivers on it. If you can see, uh, the blue river is the Indus system and the purple one is the Gagar Hakra system and the green is the Godavari system. So then I've mapped uh, all the important Harappan sites. I just indexed them, numbered them and mapped them here. Now, if I get a question, any sort of question as to say uh, a particular, uh, for instance, a Sarai Kera is on the bank of which river? I can easily answer, say Sarai Kera is uh, number one and it's on the bank of Indus system. Or there could be a question of uh, arrange the following Harappan sites from north to south or from east to west. Or, uh, you know, which of them are, are the closest to the farthest, you know, they can give you one Harappan site and it will be like, which is the closest uh, other Harappan sites to this particular Harappan site in question. So it becomes really easy for you to uh, do this. So uh, moving on. Um, Th that is all I have for history to share with you guys. Then moving on uh, with uh, geography. So again, uh, um, I, I apologize for the blot on the map. It was an accident, ignore that blot. But this is the entire river system of the country. Now this took me good uh, two to two and a half hours, but I will not regret having spent the time on this because this was extremely useful for me. See, if you can see, uh, I traced all the rivers, including the uh, tributaries on this map and everything. See, even the smaller rivers on the Western coast, the Koina, Dud Ganga, Mandavi, Zwari, Kali Nadi, and all of that. Uh, I put everything here. And what I've done after that is I've started put, making this tabular format. Just simple, simple information. Where does the river originate, the source of it? Where does the mouth of it, that is, where does it end? whether it falls into the Arabian Sea or whether it merges into another river, what are the tributaries to it and states. By states, I mean, what are the important, what are the states the river passes through and what are the important cities that are on the banks of this particular river? So now, why do I say this was very, very important to me? One, you can always answer the uh, questions directly about rivers that this river is passing through a particular uh, blah, blah, blah number of states or the which of the following states do the river pass through or which of the following are tributaries of river Ganga or which of the following tributaries originate in Malwa Plateau. You can answer all these questions. And you also have spillover effects in the sense you can also answer other questions by indirectly using this information. For instance, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come to the part later, but I've also marked all the national parks, all the wildlife sanctuaries, tiger reserves, everything on the map. 
So uh, for, there could be a question as to uh, X national park passes through uh, this river, or this river passes through X national park, or say a particular inter river inter linking project is going to affect Panna national park. So these sort of questions you can answer because you know the location of that particular national park on the map. And you also know the location of this particular river on the map. And using this two information, you can figure out whether this uh, national park is in the range of that river, which means it's highly likely that an inter -river, river linking project of that river is going to uh, harm that particular national park. So this was a list of rivers. And see, this is the Ganga system, where which Ganga is originating and how it forms River Ganga. Again, this thing that you see in the bottom right corner, uh, this Vena Karude is a, a sort of an acronym that I've made for all the five Prayagas. Vishnu Prayaga, Nanda Prayaga, Karna Prayaga, Rudra Prayaga, Dev Prayaga. So you can always form such acronyms which you can remember uh, very easily or recall very easily. You don't even need to remember it. When they ask, okay, or, you know, put these uh, Prayagas in a particular order, you will just uh, uh, recall this Vina Karude thing, and then you know what is Ru comes before Day. That means Rudra Prayaga comes before Dev Prayaga. That is all you need to know. And that will help you either fix an option or eliminate an option. And that is all you need to do. Mm -hmm. So, again, this reverse thing, I've made most of them in one go. But later on, when I was doing current affairs material for prelims, uh, whenever there comes a new river or some obscure river that you've not heard of, I just Google up that river and then I'll write the river source mouth, etc. It just takes two minutes and it, it's really useful that way. Let's see, uh, moving on, the rest are about uh, uh, again, most of it had to do with geography. And I, to me particularly, geography was one of the most difficult subjects to study because I was not from science background and I barely knew what was the difference between density, volume and pressure when I started out. So, uh, uh, which meant retention of uh, most of geography also became really difficult for me. So what I've done is this is a very uh, interesting way of doing it also, add some joy into your uh, preparation, not make it very monotonous. So what I did is I just spent an hour and then, you know, I drew the entire forest system uh, on the map. Now you can get this thing. It's not like I created this thing. These things are there on the internet. These things are there in the standard books. But why do I need to draw it? The purpose is for me to learn while also improving my muscle memory. I'll be able to retain all of it. Now, next time there might be a question as to which are the areas that has tropical thorn forest or there is no tropical thorn forest in Madhya Pradesh. Now, uh, that means the moment I see this question, I'll recall this map in my mind. And I know there is barely uh, any red. So you can see tropical thorn is red, uh, here, orange, so to say. And there is barely any orange here uh, in Madhya Pradesh, but there is a slight bit of it towards the end of it. So I'll recall this thing and I'll be able to answer that, oh yes, there is an element of tropical thorn forest in Madhya Pradesh too. Because intuitively, we might feel like there are no uh, tropical thorn forests in Madhya Pradesh because in general, it has a huge forest cover and it's one of the states with good rainfall and all of that. So this is what I've done for forests of India. Uh, see, again, this is what I said that maps were extremely useful for me while preparation. These are the mountain ranges and peaks. So everything you see here are the hills or the mountain ranges, you know, Nalamala, Velikonda, Palkonda, Nagari, Javadi, Chevroy, and all of that. And what you see in green are the plateaus, you know, Malwa plateau, Mewar plateau, Gundelkan plateau, Bethul plateau. Now this will help you answer questions like, uh, say a, a particular river, river China, or river Son, or something originates in Gundelkan plateau or Amarkand, AMK is Amarkanta plateau, a particular river originates in Amarkanta plateau true or false and you will be able to answer that quickly because you know from the reverse map you know where the river originates from and from this map you know where that particular plateau is so by connecting both of these you will be able to figure out okay this river is in the vicinity of Amarkanta plateau so it's highly likely that this river is originating from that plateau right so similarly too so everything you see in blue are the peaks that are there all the important peaks that are there now, moving on, these are the latitudes. So these are very, you can, you have to do the same exercise for India too, which I've done, but I've not put that particular map here. But uh, if you see what the number 16, where you see, this is the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, so Tropic of Cancer passes through 16 countries. 
and i've named all of them here 16 countries i've highlighted them with with just the initial of the country's name similarly 13 what you see is the equator an equator passes through 13 countries and nine what you see here is a tropic of capricorn and it passes through nine countries similarly what you see here eight is the prime meridian now why are these important for different reasons they could it can, it will again help you answer a lot of questions for instance uh, simple outright questions like okay tropic of capricorn passes through the most number of countries and you know it's clearly wrong it passes through one of the least number of countries or there could be questions like you know a particular crop uh, say coffee crop is grown widely in uh, canada and you know coffee is a tropical crop if you studied uh, geography you know co coffee needs tropical conditions and you know that uh, canada does not lie in any of the tropical regions tropical regions is between tropic of cancer and capricorn and it does not lie anywhere here. so you know uh, you can eliminate that option see i've just put all the countries here you know equator passes through 13 countries and they can even ask questions like arrange the following countries through which equator passes from east to west or north to south or west to east or which of the following countries does the prime meridian not pass see and then i concluded that algeria and mali are the only true countries which which have two things passing through them prime meridian and tropic of cancer so same goes with the oceans and seas of the world i put all the water bodies in the entire world on one map so that it becomes really easy for me to recall everything now if you see i have color coded them like each basin i have color coded with a different thing so if you see atlantic basin all atlantic basin water bodies are in orange color all pacific bodies are in red color and all this uh, uh, pink ones are the ones that are surrounding the arctic and the blue ones that you see here are the ones that are, that are to do with the indian ocean and then i made a list with the same colors for instance you see blue there and then you see all the indian ocean basin things now maybe you might be very familiar with the more important ones but the ones like uh, flor sea uh, timor sea uh, great austrian bight savu sea these are the ones that we naturally or not in general are not very familiar with same goes with other seas also so if you put them here and i would just like you know post dinner after studying after dinner is one of the uh, difficult things for me to do so i will just take out this map and then look spend some time on it you know just spend 20 25 minutes on all the maps that i have made before uh, sleeping so it will help me etch that in my mind we and trust me guys all of us have great subconscious memories or each one of us is on how we use it is depending on us you know uh, so you just look at them and in the exam and you probably say uh, see floor c and you will recall array is written in blue so that means it has to do something with indian ocean so you will be able to narrow down on the options uh, uh, before that uh, there is some sort of disturbance can you guys hear the disturbance or is it just me oh yeah it's gone uh, oh no i think it's from my end uh, sorry guys uh, so same goes with the, the climatic regions too so i have marked all the climatic regions of the world you know the koppen classification that's given in the ncrts so i've just gone by the koppen classification and i marked color coded all of them these are just crayons that you get for 10 rupees 20 rupees the crayons school uh, children use so i got those crayons and i have marked all of them here color coded them again you know for different tropical uh, i mean climatic regions so next time when i get a question as to say uh, uh, north africa has a tropical forest i know it, it does not have evergreen forest or deciduous forest because it's marked in red and these are the ones which have the evergreen deciduous and all the wet forests and all of them are in this blue slight blue green region everywhere so this is a very important way of retaining information same goes with the soils in india i put all of them on the map and i just made a list with a very short notes you know this this also helps you address a lot of questions as to uh, uh, which uh, um, you know there might be questions like you know a particular crop grows in particular soil and you know that particular crops maybe need some particular nutrient and you know the soil is either rich in that nutrient or poor in that nutrient and you will be able to answer that question um, uh, before that i think uh, rushikesh has a question rushikesh can you uh, uh, elaborate on what you mean interlinking topics in geography uh, rushikesh can you hear me
Uh, I think he's typing, so I'll just wait for him to finish what he's typing. Uh, so by interlinking topics, so uh, I'll tell you what I've done. I've just done the NCRTs, that, that two only the 11th can fell NCRTs, because like I said, uh, geography was the most difficult subject for me to learn. So I spent most of my time on the least possible books uh, that were there. So what I've done is when, say, you learn a particular chapter on, say, climate or air circulation, and then there is a chapter on oceans, you know, if you pick up the 11th NCRT, it has chapters, you know, first it deals with atmosphere, air circulation, and later on it deals with the oceans and the ocean circulations, etc. So once you learn the concept of atmospheric circulation properly, uh, you know how things work. Say maybe things flow from a high pressure zone to a low pressure zone. And you know how atmospheric circulation or say, you know, the trade winds and everything are connected to oceanic circulation. So you pick up those topics from atmospheric uh, uh, content, you know, either the pressure systems or how the winds circulate and then use it to understand your ocean currents. And that's what, what I've in fact done, you know, like link both of them and I've learned both of them simultaneously. Learn the pressure systems and everything in uh, atmosphere properly, then do with the oceans. Same goes for other ones too. For instance, if you're learning the soil conditions here, and in 12th NCRT, you have a chapter on agriculture, if I'm recalling correctly, 12th or 10th, something has a chapter on uh, agriculture and it has uh, all the crops. And last year, there was a question directly asked from NCRT uh, as to even the verb pattern, like they, they just copy pasted the entire uh, question from NCRT uh, regarding crops, you know, particular details about the particular crop was given and they were we were asked to identify which crop is it. Now, since I've, you do the soils from this NCRT, and then you learn that particular uh, uh, crops agriculture from a different NCRT, you link both of them. And then you figure out which crops work in which soil. You know, you try to bring them out intuitively. And that has helped me answer the question in the exam. I think it was to do with cotton last year. So I hope uh, I have answered your question to whatever extent I've understood, but please feel free to again, drop a text in the chat or you know, open the mic and speak out. Um, uh, moving on, uh, so this is all that I have to do, that I wanted to show you guys uh, with regards to the static portion. Now, moving on to the current affairs, how is it that I've revised the current affairs in the last one month? Now, this is what is called the active recall method, and I must thank my friends for introducing me to this. So, uh, instead of... Uh, I'm sorry, guys, I get a lot of disturbance from someone, so... Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Rishikesh, good. So, uh, so this coming to the current affairs, this is, these are vision monthly magazines and you guys can do whatever magazines that you find comfortable, be it Insights or Rauch or some other coaching institutes. So I just want to take two, three examples and show you guys how to retain current affairs uh, easily. So for instance, here you see a simple article on 131 of Indian constitution, which is to do with, uh, uh, original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court as to uh, what are the things that only Supreme Court has the original jurisdiction on. Now, I'm sure if you've done polity, all of you know that it deals with the disputes between center and states or between the states and uh, states, etc. So, uh, now, I've made a questions here. For instance, two, just two questions. So, right next to that particular topic, I would make one or two questions. And next time when I come back to revise it, I'll try to answer those questions first. And only if I'm not able to answer those questions, will I get into the content again. So, this will again help me reduce the time that I need for revision and also help me to retain information better. For instance, uh, you know, Article 31, Supreme Court deals with disputes between both center and state and also between states. So I've just made a question here. Article 30, 131 cases only between center and state and not between states. True or false? So next time I come back, I'll just answer this question. And that'll etch that particular fact in my mind. And second question is, states need to show that their legal right is violated. Only then can they uh, file an appeal under original jurisdiction in the Supreme Court. Is this true or false? And the content is not picked up from anywhere. It's right here, see. States need not show that it's 
uh, legal right is violated, but only that the dispute involves a legal question. So next time I come here, I'll answer if it's true or false. And if I'm getting it incorrect, I'll go back to this highlighted portion and then read it. Or if I'm getting it correct, I'll just move on. Now taking another example, uh, th this is to do with the mineral loss uh, amendment. And see, uh, so the government has brought up some ordinance and there was some uh, new, there was something called a composite license that was given last year for both prospecting, that is searching whether the particular area has uh, mineral reserves and also uh, for mining. Once you prospect it, you also mine it. So earlier there used to be two different licenses. Now, in addition to the two different licenses for prospecting and mining, there is also a composite license that the government started to give, a composite license for uh, both. So now I put a question here, mineral loss amendment ordinance cancels the separate prospecting and mining licenses. Now all of us will remember that a new composite license is introduced, but we might not able to, uh, we might not be able to recall whether the, previous version, which was a separate licenses, is still intact or it's, if it's cancelled. So that's why I made this question here, so that I put myself in traps right now, so that I don't fall in traps in the prelims exam. So I put this trap here, and then next time I come here, I answer this question, true or false. So I know whether I'm doing good or bad, then I'll go and revise that portion. Similarly, so again, there is a cont content here. The ordinance clarifies that the companies which do not possess any prior coal mining experience, can also participate in the auction of coal and lignite. So here again, see, I put a question. Only countries with prior mining experience are allowed. Only companies with prior mining experience are allowed, true or false. I know it's false. Like when you come back to it, you know if it's, it's true or false. And the last example, this was to do with Bodo Peace Accord of last year. So ignore the information about this particular land. That's just for my reference that I've written down. But uh, the information, the questions below the line are the ones that are important. So uh, Bode Accord removed the NDFB from UAPS Schedule 1. So NDFB is an organization that is part of National Democratic Front of Borderland, that is part of the tripartite agreement. Now, this was one of the banned organizations, insurgent group under UAPS Schedule 1. So all of us know that the Peace Accord and this one is a party to that particular accord. But we might not be able to remember whether one of the concessions that is given is it, the revoking of the status of uh, you know ban and the UPS schedule one. So now if you go through the highlights of the agreement, uh, sorry, uh, it's not written anywhere that uh, NDFP is actually uh, removed from that particular list as such. So I made your question that Bodo Accord removed NDFP from UPS schedule one, true or false. Secondly, Bodo's make up 30% of Assam population. Now, again, all of us might remember, see, Bodos are the single largest tribal community in Assam. This is a fact that's easy to remember. But it's easy to fall in the trap since we know that it's the single largest tribal community. We might think that they also form a significant portion of the population. But if you actually see, they only form 5 to 6% of the state's population. So I put myself put a trap for myself here that Bodos make up 50% of Assam population. So next time I come back, I'll either fall into the trap or I'll save myself and I'll remember this thing because I've been on the edge once. Similarly, last question, you know, all members of the Borderland Territorial Council are elected. So if you see here, all members of the Borderland Territorial Council are not elected. 40 are elected and six are nominated by the governor. Um, I'm unable to annotate here, but I hope you guys are being able to see where I'm pointing out. 40 are elected and six are nominated by the governor. So I know this question is wrong. All members are not elected, some are nominated. So this is how I've gone uh, on revising with current affairs. So I've started writing down the questions after when I was doing the first revision. And I'm sure those of you who are giving prelims this time, you, you will have the time to do at least one or two revisions of current affairs. So it's, it's, it's still not late. So make this, don't, don't end up making a question bank out of it, okay? Just make one or two questions uh, that you think are important and relevant. Now, don't make the questions like, you know, which are the three parties that are there in the board of peace accord and all of this. Then you are just overburdening yourself with too much information. Make questions on only those things that you think you will not remember or you think are confusing or you think are areas where there is a scope for you to fall in the trap. 
So only make questions out of it. And there are multiple pages where I did not even make a single question. For instance, in social issues and all of that, there are barely any like factual questions that you need to remember. At best, maybe say a global wage index is given by which organization. That is all the factual information you will have in the social issues. So there are not many questions that come from it. Similarly, with international relations too. So be wise and make only those number of questions that will make it conducive for you to revise. Now, the next one, uh, the purpose of me putting this here is for you to for me to tell you guys that be curious about what is happening around. So just before our prelims, like all of you know, last June was when the uh, China and India border crashes were happening. And all of us know what are the friction points. You all of us have heard the names Galvan Valley, Pangongso River, you know, the DBD, uh, w, this Dowlet Bay Goldie Road and all of it. We have heard all of, all of these. But I thought maybe, you know, how much time does it take for you to put this on a map? It barely takes me two minutes. So I thought I'll just uh, take the map and put everything here. You know, what is Nubra? What is Siachen Glacier? What are the important things that are near it? You know, uh, what are the cities, Leh and all of that and everything. And there was, in fact, a question, I think, last year in prelims, there was Siachen Glacier is to do with which valley. And because I've done this thing, it only took me two minutes, but it got me two marks. Uh, uh, it, I've just put this here and I could um, easily pick Nubra as the option in it right away. So be curious about what is happening around. Just take one extra step and then, you know, maybe if you're finding something interesting in the news, just Google up. Don't even like go into articles and all of it. Open the first Wikipedia page that pops up. Just scroll down from top to bottom. Like I said, our subconscious memories are extremely uh, uh, potent. So... Just going through the Wikipedia page might remind you of something in the actual exam and you'll be able to do an option and that will decide the fate of your future. Now, moving on, these are the government schemes in the current affairs. And uh, you guys can take this with a pinch of salt because uh, either you can directly do all the government skills com schemes compilations from different coaching institutes or do this thing. I particularly found this useful because I'm a person who need to write something down for me to learn. So writing is the method through which I get the content into my head. So uh, while I'm doing current affairs, uh, and current affairs obviously have a lot of schemes, I would not put all the information there. I'll just put the important ones, you know, which ministry is to do with it, and whether it's a centrally sponsored or a centrally uh, central sector scheme, and what are the two, three important uh, points for that, you know. For instance, if you see this 58th scheme, interest subvention scheme, it says loan should have been extended by scheduled commercial banks only. Only is the important thing here. So I highlighted it right away when I'm making it because it could be the case that they might ask interest subvention by regional rural banks. And you know it's wrong because it's SCB only. And wherever I feel like I might fall in a trap, I'll put the, uh, you know, the points here. For instance, cooling action plan. And it is easy for us to fall into a trap of, you know, whether it's Ministry of Power or Renewable Energy. So I consciously wanted to ensure that it's neither of them. So I put them down here, not Ministry of Power or Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, but it's Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. So you can see the numbers. So there were about 100 schemes throughout the entire year that I've put in. So I've just picked up two random pages to show to you guys. So see Matche Sampada Yojana. And you can see there is no provision for interest-free loans to farmers. So these are the areas which you think like, you know, are uh, needed or like those things that are important and you can put them down here and moving on again species this is an environment issue and also current affairs related issue so these are what is called uh, the cumulative advantage or the cumulative output that you would get that is every time you just need to put a small amount of effort but the overall end result of it would be humongous so every time I'm a, I was coming across a particular species in the current affairs magazines, what I would do is I would just keep these set of papers right next to me when I'm doing current affairs. And I'll just Google up, you know, that particular species, what is its current uh, UCN status, and just one or two details as to, you know, which area it belongs to, say, endemic to Mauritius, and what is it, a flightless bird. So this is all. Don't bulk up on information. This is all that is needed. And I personally had huge trouble with remembering so many species with what are their statuses, what are this and that, and which areas they are there and all of that. So this helped me again, like, you know, keep all of them at one place, recall them easily and also compare them. So if you see, uh, I put everything here, like, you know, I've just picked up again two random pages. And you know, like, you know, for instance, if they ask a particular vulture, if, if a particular vulture is... Uh, 
uh, question on vulture and you're confused. You know about vultures, but you're confused as to which option it is. Now, putting them at one place, what will this do? You While learning, you will subconsciously also compare between these five types of vultures. White back, red headed, white belly, slender bellied, and Indian vulture. And uh, that will subconsciously store in your head, okay, which is in which area. For instance, you see uh, a white belly is say in Eastern Himalayas and the uh, Indian vulture is in the central and peninsular region. So you will subconsciously remember that. And maybe they might ask a question, Indian vulture is in a particular national park, say uh, Pin Valley National Park or some national park, which is usually in the Himalayan region. And you might be able to eliminate that option because you know Indian vulture is largely in the central and peninsular region and not the Himalayan region. Uh, um, Ram Narayan says, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry. I do not know the information about vultures in today's news. I'm really sorry. So if you would like to talk about, us to talk about it, so just open your mic and uh, bring it on and we can discuss about that. Um, moving on. Um, so like I said in the beginning, so these are the, uh, again, learning through maths, national parks, there are 104 national parks. And I put all of them in this thing, only one side in it. You don't have to do it every day. I just put all of them in my area so that I know which location they are in. For instance, say Silent Valley is in the North, Silent Valley National Park that you see here, is in the Northern part of Kerala, whereas Ervikulam National Park and Periyar National Park are in the Southern end of Kerala. So now there might be a question as to say it is in particular biosphere reserve or a particular tiger uh, reserve is in this particular region. And you know the location, so you will be able to answer it easily or say which national park is closest to Tropic of Cancer. See, and you know, say they might give you three national parks from Madhya Pradesh and ask you which national park is closest to Tropic of Cancer. Now they might give you Satpura, Dinosaur Fossil National Park, One Vihara and uh, Sanjay National Park. And by doing this, you know, see Sanjay National Park is the one that's closest to the Tropic of Cancer. The rest are also close, but not as close as the Sanjay National Park. So like this you will be able to retain information easily and every day before sleeping i would challenge myself to recall all one or four names state wise i would start from kerala and then i would end up going all the way till assam like this way um, um, so um, in a way clockwise direction i would go so uh, at the end of the day uh, uh, towards the end of uh, the preparation closer to prelims i would be i was able to recall all the 104 uh, of each state including their locations in less than three minutes, because I was challenging myself, you know, just take two minutes and then figure out what you can. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, it was really hard for me to recall all of them, but with practice, it becomes really easy for you to recall them. Same goes with the tiger reserves too. See, I marked all the 50 tiger reserves on it. And I know Gujarat does not have a tiger reserve. And I know these states do not have a particular tiger reserve. So it becomes really easy for you to eliminate. And they might ask you a question, on this tiger reserve falls in this particular park or this particular region. And you will be able to recall very easily. See, I've done the same for biosphere reserves also. And uh, yeah, this is the latitudes, longitudes thing that I was talking to you guys. So like we've done for the world, uh, all the countries in the world, this is the, uh, for the India. This is the uh, Tropic of Cancer, the 23.5 you see here. And this is the 82.5 uh, meridian. So uh, there are usually questions as to which is the closest state, closest uh, capital city uh, to Tropic of Cancer or, you know, tropic, uh, the Meridian, or maybe with this uh, Tropic of Cancer uh, passes through how many states and or order these states from left to right and right to left. And how much time does making this map take? Only five minutes because all of you know capital, so you can just open the internet and copy down the capital locations. And you know, see, Tropic of Cancer is passing only through, so here, the ones I've ticked, it, pass, it is passing only through Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, only two states. So I've ticked it here and you can clearly see it in the map. It's passing through. These are the only two states that have both of them passing through them. So likewise, see, uh, these are the glaciers and mountain passes. This again takes good 30, 40 minutes for you. Everything in green that you see are the mountain passes that are there. Everything in black that you see are the glaciers that are there. And uh, uh, yeah, mostly the red one is, the pink one is the Suleiman Kithar ranges. So this again helps you to easily uh, talk about any particular glacier. I think there was last year or the year before, there was a particular question on this glacier and uh, match it with the rivers next to it. Now you've done the reverse map, you know where the rivers are coming from or where they, they are from. Now they might say Nubra Glacier and then Ganga River. And you know it's clearly wrong because Nubra Glacier is here 
and then you know from that map Ganga River is originating here. Same goes with Zemu Glacier and say Yamuna River. You know Zemu Glacier is here, and from the map you know Yamuna River is originating somewhere else. So you will be able to interlink these things and be able to eliminate the options or zero in on a particular option. And now this is mostly what I have to do in terms of what I have to share with you guys in terms of current FS and the static portion. Now the next part is, is how I've solved the question papers and how what was my strategy for solving the questions in the tests and also my way of analyzing that. But before we move on, does anyone have uh, any questions with the prelim specific part that we've talked so far, be it the static portion or the current FS portion? Uh, all right, uh, so let's move on. So this part is about the current uh, the test solving. So what I've done in, in solving a test is what is called risk categorization. And again, this is something that I've picked from my friends to whom I'm really grateful for this. So what do I mean by risk categorization? The, once I get the question paper, the first thing I do is go through each question and categorize them into four categories. Category one, two, three and four. And the risk involved in that question increases with the rank, you know, category four is the riskiest of the questions for me to do. And category one is the least riskiest of the questions for me to do. So, uh, and how do you make the categories? For instance, C, this is a paper from last year that I picked up. This was uh, Rao's uh, full length test four, I think if I'm recalling correctly. So uh, I just picked up two snippets from that particular question paper to show to you guys. So say uh, you see the first question. Uh, so how is how do I categorize it as number two? I categorize it as number two because I've eliminated two options from there. A and B I've eliminated because I know two is correct and two is not there in option A and B. So I've eliminated those two. So now I need to pick between option B and option C. So there are since I have to pick from two options, it's a category two question from me, for me. And here, likewise, I've eliminated option B. And I need to pick from A, C, and D. Hence, it's a category three question for me. And in third one, I knew that D was correct, but I wanted to recheck. But since I almost knew that it was a correct answer, it was a category one question because I sure shot know that it was a correct answer. Same goes C fourth question. Uh, again, two options were eliminated. I know uh, in MP lad scheme, each MP gets five crores and not two crores. So I could easily eliminate option one in this question, which means uh, A and B are out and I have to pick between B and C. So it's a category two question for me. So likewise, you can see I categorize the entire paper into say one, two, three, and see there are category four questions also. I didn't know anything at all about Inspire program and I took this test or this Tyndall effect that's talked about. I couldn't eliminate any option. So I had to pick from one of the four options, which meant it's a category four question. So now what is the purpose of uh, categorizing this entire paper? Two things. One is, you know how to prepare in the last one month. You know, you will figure out what is the return on investment that we'll get on the particular subject. And second is the risk taking. So I've known my seniors and my friends from college who were doing exceptionally good in their uh, uh, tests. They were one senior I remember was even getting 140s and above in the test series. But he could not, he could not, he cleared last prelims with a border score, but this prelims he could not score also, he could not clear also. And the reason being in the end, during the stress of the exam, what most of us do is we end up attempting a lot of questions that are risky or that will give you a net negative. By net negative, I mean they are more likely to go wrong than they are to go correct. Understand? So uh, so by risk optimization, firstly, by risk optimization, by, what do I mean by that? For instance, uh, after doing this, uh, also before that, guys, uh, one thing I want to stress on is analyzing your tests is as important, if not more important than taking the test. So whenever it's a choice between, say, taking two tests or taking one test and analyzing it, always go for the first one. I would always recommend you do that because... What is the purpose of taking the test? It, they are not going to answer direct questions in, from these tests in the actual exam. So you are learning the skill, your skill of attempting this particular paper. What are the tactics you use to arrive at an answer or eliminate an option? Or, and what are the learnings for you from that? So uh, coming back to the risk optimization thing, 
say maybe you figure out that uh, all of most of your polity questions are falling in category 1 and category 2 now what does this tell you uh, because category 2 you're already eliminated two options and you just need to eliminate one more option so you know by just putting some more effort maybe give one or two hours every day you will be able to push those category 2 questions into category 1 thereby you are optimizing that entire uh, polity question because it's a low hanging fruit for you because you there most of them are just in one and two and these are what are called the low hanging fruits and you need to hold on to them so you'll push them into category 1 by just putting some effort into it now say uh, category 4 for instance medieval history was largely in category 3 and 4 for me so now what is your strategy in terms of return on investment in this i know most of them are in 3 and 4 and i barely had one month which meant i could not go back and start doing a new book or a new source on medieval history to up my knowledge so what would i do uh, i would anyways attempt medieval history questions only when i am not getting the enough number of attempts that is say if i need 80 questions to attempt and i'm just getting say 65 to or 70 questions from category 1 and 2 only then will i go to category 3 questions so which means medieval history at best is going to come of rescue to me in a difficult situation where i'll not have enough category 1 and 2 so i only put so much effort that some questions of medieval history in category 3 are pushed to category 2 and that is all i did not put in the effort to push uh, my questions of medieval history in category 4 to category 1 because that meant i was investing a lot of time in it without enough return so this entire categorization process will tell you where you need to divert your investment say 2 hours of putting in polity will push you into the category 1 but same 2 hours of putting in medieval history might at best push me from category 4 to category 3 so now you know which area you need to put your uh, time and effort on because time is money right now so uh, that is the purpose of this entire risk categorization so one and two are the ones that you would uh, attempt and three are the ones also you most mostly attempt uh, uh, if you want the number like say 80 questions 82 questions category 4 are the ones you do not touch at all i mean i personally never touched at all unless it's a do or die situation that i need this question say i'm only getting say 70 questions of 1 2 and 3 so i have to write say 10 more questions so i'll only then venture into category 4 now this will help you because uh, not repeat what the senior that i spoke to has done he was doing very good till the last 10 15 minutes but in the end he felt like oh maybe he needs to answer like more questions just i mean it's common all of us go through that feeling in the exam hall so what is done is he ended up marking a good 10 12 questions in the end and most of them turned out to be negative so if i know all of them are category 4 i'll be more wary of uh, attempting those questions because there's a clear indication these are category 4 and they're more likely to go wrong for me yeah vedant you have a question go ahead Oh. Vedant, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. All right, I think there's some issue. Uh, yeah, so this I hope this risk categorization thing is uh, uh, convenient for all of you. So this risk categorization thing I've done uh, while solving the paper only. So this is the first thing I would do immediately after taking the question paper. Uh, even in the exam hall actual exam this is what i did the moment i get the question paper go through each questions 20 25 minutes of the exam goes into categorization only for me i would mark each of them into 1 2 3 and 4 then i'll come to one and i'll figure out all all ones are correct and then i'll mark them in the omr right away then i'll come to two and then i'll figure out the answers and mark them in the omr then i'll slowly in the last 30 40 minutes i'll go through category 3 and 4 and whatever question i think i need to attempt i'll put that particular question in the omr so that is what i've done hope uh, that's clear to you and the next slide is about the post analysis of the test so i used to take a test for 2 hours and then i used to spend good 3 to 4 hours on the test analysis now this time i differ depending upon how versed you are with that particular topics in the test or how Uh, unaware you are about that particular topic in the test now why i'm showing you this particular uh, analysis sheet of the same very test is to for you to understand how to put all of it in concise form for you to recall them easily now i hope all of you know what's an a3 sheets uh, a3 sheet is a one which has four sides to it which you can fold in between it has four sides to it so i picked an a3 sheet and i would 
write down the answers of all of these hundred questions in only that A four A three sheet. That means only uh, consider it to be two A four papers are only the ones that will have all my hundred questions in it, and I'll only put that information which I think I might not remember. See, like first question, then two, three, and four are the ones either I remember or is already covered in some other material, or uh, I've already know correct. So I I then do the fifth question, the ninth question, and only like you know tidbits of it, like just uh, very crisp information. Don't you know paste everything that is there. So it becomes really easy for you to recall. See, this is what I was talking about. This is an A3 sheet which has two sets, and in the back also it has the same two sheets. So if you see, uh, all my hundred questions were over, and this is a continuation of the first paper. So all hundred questions were done in this thing only. See, I've just wrote one line as to most of the questions, only that in important information. And next time, whenever I'm coming to revise, uh, do my set of revisions. These are always the first set of revisions because, like they say, doing a mistake twice is a crime. If you've done, a, a, if you've gotten a question incorrect in a particular test. You cannot blame anyone else but you if you're doing the same mistake in the actual exam. So I decided to not uh, do such a thing. So whenever I'm coming back to revision, this is the these are the first ones. Like all the test notes that I've made are the first ones that I would come to in the revision. Then go to whatever static or current affairs portion that I need. Now the last one. This is a test analysis sheet that it I run I run it on Excel. You can either run it on Excel or you can maybe just do it on a paper uh, pen mode. So I this is a bloody screenshot. I hope you guys are able to see this properly. So uh, if you can see, I put all the test series here, and then uh, so someone is asking if the same thing has to be done for uh, all the tests. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, should, uh, it has to be done for every test because that's the purpose of it. The purpose of it is for you to know, uh, equip yourself with that new questions that are there. And then so that if this new content is asked in the actual exam, you will not miss it. That's the whole purpose of it. So all the questions that I've written here are actually the new information only. Whatever you're seeing on this analysis sheet. You know, for instance, extrajudicial killings, I know what extrajudicial killings are when I took the test. But this one point that is there is the one that I do not know of before. This is the extra new information that is there for me. So, so everything like that, you know, say lithium triangle, what are the countries that are there? Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, that is all. See, similarly, environmental DNA can also be sourced from extracellular DNA. So all of us have read about DNA and all of that before taking that test. So this is the new information which I've put down here. So the whole purpose of it is for you to remember the new information that is there. So similarly, see, if you see the question here, uh, River Varuna is a tributary of Yamuna. And this is something that I've not covered in the rivers uh, map, if you've seen. I did not have this thing there. And this is new information to me. That's why I've written here, River Varuna is a tributary of Yamuna. That is all. So uh, I hope that was clear. And uh, moving on, this is what is called the test analysis sheet. And uh, if you can see, I put all the tests here, then whether I've attempted it or not, if I've attempted it, I put it in green. And if I've done the analysis of it, I would also put green in the analysis thing. Now I hope these are pretty self-explanatory, how many questions I've attempted, how many I got correct, how many I got incorrect, and what's my score. Now this cutoff is something I've gotten the average of the last uh, uh, five, three years for my category. And I put the average cutoff here. So this was the benchmark for me to pass. And everything you see in green are the ones where I've scored more than the average cutoff for the last three years, if you can see. And red are the ones where I've not scored. And I know which tests I'm not scoring in. See, most of these are APIAS tests, uh, vision IAS tests. So I, I figured out maybe I'm not doing well in vision tests. So I went back to the magazines and I studied them better and all of that. Now, if you see here, uh, this accuracy thing is a very uh, important thing. This um, uh, Excuse me for this uh, blurry screenshot, but uh, I hope you're able to figure out something out of this. Uh, by accuracy, what I mean is how many questions you're getting correct out of the total attempted questions. So it will be, say, for this particular thing, 51 upon 87 into 100 is your accuracy. That is, you're getting 51 questions correct out of 87, and that's your accuracy. But uh, and ideal accuracy, what people say is 67% accuracy. That is, you get two questions correct out of every three you attempt. And I figured out that uh, my ac accuracy is not my forte. 
it's not my style see in most of the times i'm not getting the accuracy correct you see all of them in red so what does that tell me that tells me since i'm not getting accuracy is not my strength i should increase the number of attempts you know uh, increase the number of questions that i'm attempting because at least that will save so you can see that here uh, i was attempting in the 70s uh, you know largely 74 70 73 and all of that but the moment i realized it's not working out i switched on to like 81 87 85 and all of that so figure out some people i know people who have only attempted like say 67 questions in the actual exam or less than 70 and still cleared prelims for them the accuracy is very high they have more than 80% accuracy that is almost every question they get they give uh, four by five times they get it correct so i realize accuracy is not my strength so i've increased the number of attempts so figure it out for yourself so the whole purpose of this exercise is to figure it out for yourself and also putting this in chart and it's not it's not a very tedious exercise trust me because once you put in everything here you you just put the digits here 28 14 and it will automatically calculate the scores and percentiles everything for you i mean percentage is something that the institutes themselves give so you can't do much about it but accuracy is something that it will excel will automatically calculate it for you so the purpose of this is to figure out track your preparation you know whether you're going on the right path whether your scores are increasing or whether you are uh, you know whether you're doing too many incorrects whether maybe you need to reduce the number of incorrects or whether you're taking too many attempts you need to reduce the number of attempts so this is the whole purpose of it and this is what i've done in the last uh, 45 days you can still start you have about a month to do so so start in the last uh, 45 um, do you can start right away so this is mostly all i have uh, with regards to do uh, with uh, context or content specific information as to prelims what to do and what not to do now uh, yeah that is all i have now please feel free to ask any questions regarding mains everything that you have uh, i think uh, jyotin mai you had a question right regarding uh, mains so uh, jyotin mai can you hear me is she there uh alright i think her question was to do with how do we write 250 marks answers to it um i'm sorry i did not put in any main specific content in this because uh, i thought talking about interview and prelims would be uh, more helpful to you guys currently that's what sir has told me but what i've done for means is uh, a one page one concept thing in which uh, for every uh, particular concept i would make notes on one a4 sheet and all the notes relating to that concept will only be on that a4 sheet again which will help me in for instance india usa relations i will put uh, what are the history of india usa relations two three points you know like when did our bilateral relations start we've been good partners or you can pick up data from economic survey one of our second largest state partner of india is usa etc you can put it there and then what are the current issues maybe the generalized system of preferences us challenging india's developing country status or something of that so you can put all of them there Uh, and then what are the challenges of the india us relations currently and then what's the way forward in the way forward you can pick up slogans that the prime minister gives you know when he goes on tours or like uh, pib documents have a lot of slogans coming in which conveniently the coaching institutes also bring out you can do all of that and uh, yeah more or less this is all i have to say uh, someone has how to prepare ethics yeah so uh, so with regards to ethics satyam what i have done is uh, i all of you uh, if you are not giving uh, this setup but next setup start preparing for ethics for much before prelims gs 1 to 3 can still be put slightly on the back burner vis a vis gs 4 so what i have done is uh, uh, firstly i collaborated with a friend of mine and both of us made notes together on one note which is in a uh, microsoft app that you get for free on any of your laptops so what we did was um, we went through different books d subbarao sir's book or uh, modit raj modit jain sir's book or uh, in general the all the ethics books that are there in the market and uh, i i pasted all the syllabus in front of me i i wish i could show it to you guys so uh, see I, i don't know if you guys are able to see it or not but syllabus is pasted right in front of me so i would pick up one particular uh, word from the syllabus in ethics say aptitude and foundational values then i'll write down a uh, definition of what is aptitude what is a foundational value and what is just just the definitions of it don't go too deep into that thing because ethics is one paper where you will learn the best 
in the, uh, where you learn the best by practicing. You know, the more you practice, is the more you learn. You can't learn a lot of it before writing our answers. So uh, I've just learned the definitions of all of it, like what is attitude, what is aptitude, what are beliefs, values, emotions, etc. Differentiate all of them with one one example, and these are the ones you can just go Google up. I've extensively used internet for ethics. Um, I would go say beliefs versus values. Type it on Google, you will get nice flow charts, nice tables, and all of that, and write them down in your notes. And your thumb of rule or your guiding light will be the syllabus. Don't go beyond the syllabus words because ethics is an ocean where you can get lost in. So after that, what uh, we have done is we started picking up examples. Again, we made a table and both of, both of us could edit that table. So whenever I see a particular example of, say, a particular IS officer, recently there was an IS officer in Maharashtra by name Rakesh Jhang if I'm recalling correctly, who's done some good work in terms of oxygen, uh, you know, a crisis in his district and all of, all of that. So the moment I see that, I'll put that uh, person's name there and I'll just write the context of it in that table. Similarly, when she comes across something of that sort, uh, she would put them there. So by the end of it, it become a huge table with good 40, 50 names with different examples. And every time before I had to take an ethics test, I would just go through this table. And you can generously quote these examples everywhere in ethics and they'll hugely appreciate that. And uh, after that, what I've done, like I said, ethics is one paper where you learn the best through practice. Uh, and uh, after prelims, what I've done, before prelims only, I've written a lot of questions, but never case studies. So after prelims, what I've done is Insights has this program called 75 Days Ethics Plan, where they give you two questions every day and then you write and post them on the comment section there. So I started following that. I tried my best to follow uh, that. And now after my writing my answers, I would spend half an hour on going through other people's answers. Because in GS questions like say, what a cloud bus, there is nothing much you can learn from some other answers. The fact remains the same for you or the other person. But in ethics, there is so much you can learn from other people's answers because they're very subjective. Some other person can interpret it in a different way or you can get a lot of examples from the other person's answers. So uh, I would pick, again pick that up and then write those examples in this table, the running table that I have uh, with me. So uh, that is largely how I prepared for ethics. But uh, be prepared for very unconventional papers in ethics because that's how it was in our case. So yeah, I hope I've addressed your question there. And uh, next question is uh, Dinesh question. Your modern history, but uh, yes, Dinesh, a modern history is definitely required. I wouldn't say definitely required for ancient and medieval. If you have time, go into it. Like I said, it depends from person to person. Some people, I know people who hate polity and they just do not like polity. And I know people who hate ancient and medieval history and they do not like it. So depending on you, but modern history is definitely a low-hanging fruit. It's something where you can score 100 on 100 in the sense you can get all the questions correct. In fact, in, in this uh, prelims that I gave 2020, uh, polity, history, economy are the questions that have sailed me through. I got almost all of them correct. Thanks to the, these notes that I've done. And they were very easy questions also. So always concentrate on return on investment, not just for Dinesh, but all of you guys keep that in mind. Return on investment should be your thumb rule. Before you delve into a particular venture, say you're talking, you're going to do uh, this particular book and then you figure out, you take a moment, step back and figure out, okay, how much return on investment do I get from this book? It's modern history. So I get a lot of return on investment, but say if it's uh, uh, some geography extra book that I have, I may not get so much return on investment, so I'll not do it. So Modern history, definitely you need to get every fact that possible out there in modern history. And in terms of ancient, try your best. For this, what helped me is uh, institutes like Rao's release compass before the prelims. So I picked up the compass and then I only revised the summaries of compass. Like for instance, uh, uh, they had an entire list of all the kings uh, uh, from Del starting from the Delhi Sultanate till the end of the Mughal rule. They had all the kings briefly with what are the important decisions that they've taken, important terminologies of medieval history. So I picked up from these things. Like I said, my only aim was to push category three questions of medieval history into category two, you know? So I just put in that effort. And in the actual exam, what happened was I had to attempt four medieval history questions to get 80 number. So I attempted four out of which I ended up getting three corrects because of this thing, three to two. I was slightly lucky also, but this thing, 
you know, I didn't spend too much time on it, but I did not risk neglecting that particular area also. So try to figure out that balance in history, but modern history, definitely go for it. Now, uh, uh, Manikanta and Sumit, I'll come to your questions right after answering Lima's question. So how helpful was current affair magazines for solving CSE 2020? So uh, Lima, what I would say is, um, yeah, sure, they're, they're definitely not helpful. Like there are no questions that you would get directly as such from the current affairs material. But why is current affairs material do import, uh, important for you? Uh, because uh, maybe you might do uh, notes making from newspaper. In fact, I did that work. And my opinion on it might differ from person to person, but I call it hard work. But there is something called hard work and donkey work. I, I call it donkey work because I ended up doing that. But there is also something called smart work. So what I did is in the first uh, 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 good seven, eight months, I used to sit religiously every night and make uh, news, notes out of newspaper uh, every day for good one, one and a half hours. So I don't know, maybe I, I could show you guys that uh, notes too. Um, so what happened at the end of the day is I ended up making too much notes and I could never go back to revising it. So uh, uh, these magazines are the ones that are, people are getting paid to make these magazines. So you can never be better than them. So read the magazines and why current affair magazines help you is uh, for you to eliminate an option or for you to the subconscious memory that I was talking about. It will help you subconsciously eliminate an option or get it an option. And thirdly, the confidence that you need while you enter the exam is if you are going into the exam, knowing very well that you've not done current affair magazines or current affair materials, you are tend, you will tend to be slightly underconfident because of that. And I didn't want to take that risk because everyone else is doing and I'm not uh, doing. So um, that's the reason you need to do current affairs. So in a way, I would say they're inevitable. You need to do them. You will not have direct uh, returns from them, but the indirect returns from current affair magazines are huge. So go for that. And um, um, so next question is, oh, I'll come to the distractions part and the timetable part that they've asked. So that was actually one of the things that I wanted to show to you guys from the previous uh, uh, PDF. Yeah, so just give me a moment. Uh, I think I got the wrong one open. Yeah, so these are the, la the last ones that are there in the PDF, or if you please take a look at it. So these, these are what um, uh, I call tracking sheets. So I would track my entire preparation through this, and this is the last thing I would do in a day before I go to bed. Uh, so, and you know, th this making a stable tabular format does not take more than five minutes. On any break day or when you're chilling, just you can make this entire tabular format for an entire month. So one, two is for 1st of February, 2nd of February, the dates that you see on top are the, that. And I had certain goals that I set for myself and you can have different goals. I had the goals of reading newspaper, waking up on time, less than two hours I'm spending on time, whether I'm exercising that day. And I have the habit of writing a journal every day before I sleep. So whether I've written the journal and how much time I've spent in the day studying. And I do a very uh, honest assessment of whether I've studied properly or not. See, you can also see days I've studied only for two hours, two and a half hours, or I've just skipped studying. And these are the times without newspaper. I never counted newspaper studying into this time because I don't know, I felt that gives me some sort of uh, uh, fake productivity for lack of a better word. I get all complacent that I'm studying. So I, I omitted the newspaper one, but rest of it. So you could see 1st of February, I was studying seven and a half hours a day, excluding newspaper, which would be around one and a half hours. So roughly I was studying nine hours per day and then add one and a half hour to every day in the end. And how much time out of that am I giving for the optional? So, uh, uh, so similarly, see, it goes for the month of May too. So every 15 days, I would make this thing. So uh, my uh, motivation would be to ensure I have the least number of gaps in this thing. And I, it used to be very stress relieving also. Before sleeping, I would just color these. I would have a lot of color pencils on my table and I would color these blocks. And there is some inexplicable satisfaction I would get at the end of it from, uh, you know, uh, uh, coloring this every day. So figure that thing out. But... Um, yeah, this is a very uh, tedious process, it's a grueling process. So if anyone is telling you that they're studying 24 seven, they have been motivated all through, they're lying. No one can be fully motivated throughout. No one can be on the top of the game throughout their entire preparation. I had very low times too, like for instance, I remember last June and July were one of the lowest times. I could barely get myself to study anything. But I think the most important thing for all of us is not the falling, but to pick ourselves from that particular fall. 
and usually what happens at least in my case what has happened uh, used to happen is i would go on a spiral like i don't study today and that will feed on to tomorrow and i'll not study tomorrow also because i got used to the comfort of not studying yesterday i nicely went out ate watched youtube so i got into that comfort so do something that will break you break this cycle you know maybe pick up a subject that you really love that's really easy or something that revision where you do not uh, like this there's a strategy in management which is called if you get the door into if you get your feet into the doorway you can easily slowly manage your way into the room just put your leg in the doorway then you can get into the room so just do piecemeal efforts first start doing something easy then once you again get yourself into the group then again you push yourself into uh, you know working really hard after that so that is there and how do i keep myself from distractions i have gone off all social media i was um, uh, and i was one of those kids who was glued to phones in college like my friends would mock me as a mobile glue in college because entire day i would be on my mobile to the extent that my thumbs would hurt at the end of the day from all the typing instagram facebook twitter whatsapp you name it i have it then slowly i then again i was conscious that suddenly if i remove everything it will be like a major shock and i'll not take it so i've done a gradual approach uh, after coming home so 2019 may i graduated i've come back home in july 2019 so july 2019 end was my birthday so after my birthday i told myself okay i'll not i'll take take instagram or uh, facebook so i removed both of them and i went on and on and on and then after 8 9 months i think in february of 2020 i removed whatsapp also and trust me guys it becomes really all even i was one of those people who thought it becomes really difficult without whatsapp you cannot live without whatsapp and all of that but trust me it was one those months were one of the most blissful months of my life because you are in your own world fully dedicated to preparation and it's easy this process requires us to make a lot of sacrifices so maybe you are seeing people statuses or instagram they're chilling in goa they're partying or they're doing well earning lakhs of money and you're sitting at home and studying so you tend to get demotivated and i didn't want any of want to take any of those risks so i went off it so please consider going off it all i told myself is which at this one year you will not even remember in your life but the effort of you not being the impact of you not being on whatsapp for this one year you will carry that for the rest of your life because that will aid in your selection and you'll carry that for the rest of your life that is what i did so i hope i was able to answer that and then coming to athira's question dynamic subjects like ecology and environment again ecology and environment what i did was uh, ncert textbooks 11th and 12th uh, particularly those last four chapters in 12th class ncert biology and then i made short notes out of it i have them i thought it would be too much if i show every subject that's why i didn't put it in the slide uh, uh, then uh, what i've done is i picked up uh, the compass magazine again of rouse and i've gone through that because all the current affairs are put at one place then mostly i've learned from the text series so environment and ecology are the ones that i have emphasized the most and science and tech are the ones that i have emphasized the most in the test because i come from a non science background it becomes really difficult for me to remember stuff like say i wouldn't write as many economics questions because my graduation was economics so only way you can do is keep learning keep learning from test that is all you can do for dynamic subjects like ecology and environment shankar i did selectively only those conventions some concepts but i didn't do all of shankar i personally found it to be too much heavy on information and i thought i'll never be able to remember so much information so uh, then dinesh's question as to uh, nonsense background how did you deal with science and tech articles of sunday hindu and vision mental science so uh, dinesh what i did is uh, like i said investment is some these are the areas where your investment will go along there so for instance i remember uh, i was doing uh, doing the entire um, current affairs section on nuclear uh, uh, profile of india what are the different stages of nuclear and all of this and i had no clue what thorium is what uranium is i just heard the names but they greek to me i don't know what their chemical uh, compositions are atomic numbers are what do they do and all of that so i spent good four five hours learning what these are and there are a teen number of videos out there a teen number of online sources so i've learned them you know uh, uh, the concept properly and once you learn the concept properly it becomes very easy for you to apply so again a general suggestion for all of you people every time it's a decision you have to choose between learning a concept and learning a factual information or like a current affairs thing 
always go for the concept because if you learn the concept, you will be able to apply it to the current affairs thing, extrapolate it to the current affairs thing in actual exam. But the other way does not work. You know the current affairs fact, but you do not know the concept behind it. You won't be able to do a good job. So um, with regards to Sunday uh, Hindu ones, uh, I felt most of them uh, uh, were covered in the vision monthly magazines that were there. And few that were there, uh, and I used to read Hindu. Like I would, a Sunday used to be my favorite day for Hindu because I used to read, uh, love reading all those uh, magazines and even the science uh, and tech part. So if it's something that I feel is not related to mains, I would just skim over it and leave it. If it's something that uh, I think is very relevant for prelims, then I'll again learn the concept of it. For instance, uh, pollination is there. And then I just learn the concept. Okay, these are the ones that do the pollination. This is the process of pollination. Or they might say, you know, a new DNA has come out then i'll just figure out okay what is dna what is genes and what is that particular name if it's that particular name i'll write it down somewhere you know be it in my environment notes or in science and technology notes etc but science and technology again heavily relied on the uh, last year's compass of rows and which i still have it with me which i'm planning to use for this attempt too so lastly i think satyam has a question on how do we practice uh essay essay test sales. So Satyam, what I have done is, and again, guys, this is something I would again recommend to all of you, have good two or three friends uh, with you while preparing. Uh, if, uh, if At least I've reached the interview stage and I must, I give all of the credit to my friends that I had throughout the preparation who were preparing because this preparation can be an echo chamber in that you always feel what you're doing is correct, what you're doing is okay. So I had friends who could motivate me while also keep me grounded. I remember when I started writing the main answers, the first few answers I, I wrote, I thought I wrote brilliantly. I would research like, and I would write it like a research paper. I, and I was on cloud nine because I've given such amazing information that you would only find in science journals and all these magazines. Then I remember my friend called me up and then she gave me one good one and a half hour lecture on, okay, this is a general studies. So it's not a research paper and you need to write all general points and then you can maybe give one or two different points, but you cannot just dump all the different unique points at the cost of the general and essential points. So that brought me to the ground. I realized where I was doing the mistakes and then I moved on. So with regards to SS2, that's what I've done. I practiced good uh, say 15, 16 essays before uh, prelims. Um, and we had the luxury of prelims getting postponed. So there was more time. I started out in January, 2020, when my prelims was in October, 2020. So I wrote good 10 essays in, uh, um, before prelims. And I got them evaluated by my friends who were preparing and my seniors who were preparing. And after uh, prelims, I gave good five tests for, from four MIS. That means I wrote 10 essays from four MIS and got them evaluated. And uh, in my case, uh, essay is one of the areas where I'm slightly more comfortable than other papers. So that was the number of ones I've attempted. But if say SS is an area where you think you are not doing very good, so maybe you can take more tests, but definitely, definitely start writing uh, essays before uh, prelims. That takes time uh, for you to, because initially I could only write like say five pages of essay, six pages of essay, but actual exam demands that you write 10 pages of an essay. And uh, uh, there is one good strategy of essay writing by Vikram Greval. You can Google up. He was AIR 51 in 2018. Uh, he was my senior in college. So this is a essay strategy that I picked up from him. I wouldn't go into the details of it. You can just go into the details on YouTube. You can just type Vikram Greval essay strategy and you'll get that. So please, I recommend you all of you go through that. It's really helpful. And then uh, can you please suggest for regional language paper um, in mains so you're talking i suppose you're talking about uh, the telugu compulsory telugu paper i think uh, uh, sangram so in my case i did uh, i've done telugu till my 12th standard so i was comfortable with telugu and also in general i uh, have grown up reading uh, you know two telugu delhi scenes one sakshi and uh, the magazines weekly magazine so i didn't really practice anything for the telugu this thing but i had one of my friends from uh, tirupati she was in cbsc so she had slight difficulty with uh, uh, this thing, uh, writing Telugu, getting it correctly. So what she did is, uh, right, don't, you don't need to do anything for it before the uh, prelims. All you need to get is 75 marks out of 300. You will get that, those many marks easily. And then if you look at the papers also, they're very basic, like regional language papers are a 10th standard uh, basic, like, you know, write an essay in English to Telugu, Telugu to English, or then, you know, uh, uh, 
translate something or like you know what what is the opposite of this meaning of this are pretty easy but what she has done is started reading the newspapers like say 20 days telugu newspapers not reading by reading don't spend one hour just go through the newspapers like you know uh, for 10 15 minutes every day before the main so she started doing it from end of uh, december and then second thing she did is there is something called vyasa lahari it's a guide i don't know how many of you remember most of us have done it in our 10th standard it's a violet colored book with which has uh, called vyasa lahari it has compact essays on different topics in telugu so she got that book it's, it it doesn't cost much it's 60 rupees or 70 rupees so she got that book and then she went through the entire essays the day before the exam because uh, you have you have time before so it's Uh, the language papers happen before your optional papers and you have four days break before your language papers so she was the night before all of us were staying together in a guest house my other friends and i because we had the same center and what we did was we just went through the vyasa lahari essays and we discussed the ideas and we were able to write that so that is all i can tell you about the regional languages uh so dinesh is asking uh, when to start note making so dinesh uh for most subjects don't make your notes in the first go uh, but if it's a thing but if you are someone like me who work through this way that you know you need to write them down for you to learn the concept write them down for instance the notes on modern history and all of that that you see from above these are these are the ones oh, apologies these are the ones that i have uh, written or made after doing one or two revisions that is one 30 days 45 days before the actual exam but uh, don't get me wrong i am not learning the concept for the first time 30 days or 45 days before the actual exam there's a huge difference between them i already know the concept i understood all of these concepts uh, to my best extent extent possible before these 30 45 days only i have only put all of it together in concise form before the prelims the reason for that is if you start making notes right away in the beginning when you're learning it for the first time you do not know what is important you do not know what is important so you'll end up reproducing the entire uh, textbook again in the notes so you will put everything in your uh, memory and then uh, only those stuff which you think are relevant or which you might not remember only make notes out of those but for subjects like geography geography was a difficult subject for me and i was learning them from youtube videos of this uh, mrunal so i had to make notes while i was watching the videos i cannot possibly go back and watch 45 minutes 50 minutes videos every time i need to revise so while watching only i would make down my notes of everything that i need to remember so that is all uh, i have done so uh, do it according to your convenience like if you think you need to learn via writing do it right away if you need think you can learn the concept and take the notes later do it right away or also guys like i said get two to three friends who are preparing seriously and collaborate with them that saves time and effort and you have still have the notes i did the same for ethics i did the same for world history i did the same for uh, uh, it's some concepts in gs3 and gs2 like you know which committees are there and all of that so there is a factual information and then it's all put at one place and it's nice so please do that and i hope that i have addressed uh, all the questions yeah so does anyone have any more questions guys uh, if any one of you have any questions please uh, message it now uh, we have taken a lot of time from uh, vijay yeah. already and no, 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 <laughs> more than happy to be interacting with you people thank you thank you vijay Uh, so guys that is all and uh, uh, before i leave i would two things uh, this is a very grueling process but then keep your spirits high at the end of the day it will all be worth it and always learn from your mistakes even in the beginning when i started out i read a lot of blogs i had a lot of seniors from my college who were in the service and all of that then i thought what can go wrong like i've done all of this so unless i'm very stupid i can't possibly make mistakes but come february 7 months into preparation i realized i have done so many mistakes i have not prepared my optional in the beginning and i've done a lot of mistakes i did not decide on my optional in the beginning and all of that so always take out time to figure out where you're going and part of it is also talking with your friends and then realizing where you're going and correct on your mistakes and uh, keep working hard that's the only way out there and uh, yeah all the very best guys uh thank you vijay uh, students i think you had a great time and great inspiration and great insights uh, from vijay uh, i have uh, listened to the uh, lecture vijay it was really insightful you have put up so much uh, effort into I'm glad it i like it be of help 
students i uh, want to know that we had only one hour time but uh, vijay took the extra time out of his schedule and uh, gave gave it to us <laughs> I, i was consciously trying to not put in too much information like i said uh, but i'm glad you guys uh, uh, stuck thank, through thank till you, the vijay. end thank but you also, and, uh, also guys in case if you need any uh, help or any thing that you would like to talk about please feel free to get my number from vikram sir or vishnu sir and you can drop me a text and i'll get back to you when you i can definitely definitely vijay vijay uh, vishnu ias academy is wishing you all the best for the results thank we you so much very eager for that like uh, you are one of the uh, when if, uh, we actually we have around the six students from our uh, uh, who are going to the interview right now for the first attempt and we are really excited special always when the student from the first attempt you know go to that it's really like you know vishnu sir has been great help i must give him the credit i don't think he's here but He was the first one I took my mock interviews with, and that helped me streamline my entire preparation for the interview. After that, so thanks to Vishnu IS Academy also for that. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, so it's been a very great session. Uh, so guys, we will come up more with this, and uh, if you need any help from Vijay, please let me know. I will help you yeah. out to connect with him, and uh, let's uh, keep the questions uh, very strict and very to the point next time, so that we don't take much of no, time. You, if it, no, just feel free to drop me a text on my number on WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever, and I'll get back to you ASAP. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. It was. Thank-